Okay, let's get started. Um, I was first introduced to Walking Sticks work in 1990 when I had the opportunity to see the Decade Show in New York City. At the time, she was one in one of the most richest periods of her career, creating some of her most powerful diptychs, work which for many would largely, largely define her career. But as many of us know, there is so much more. One of the benefits of creating a large retrospective of an influential and prolific artist like Walking Stick is the opportunity to examine her work in depth. With the publication and symposium, we hope to delve deeper and look more closely at her work throughout her career, the relationship of her work to other art movements, and the implications and framing of her work, and by extension, the work of other Native artists in the larger American art field. For this first session, Art Practice and Purpose, we have invited four scholars to speak about her practice as an artist from different perspectives. The first three focus on the development of her work during specific periods of her career, and we conclude with the perspective of one of her compatriot painter artists. I'd also like to mention that all four speakers in this first half are SAS in the exhibition catalog. After our last presentation of this first session, our speakers will return to the stage and we will have a question and answer session. So please hold your questions until then. I will be introducing each of our speakers briefly. However, you'll find their bios in your printed program. So let me introduce Kate Morris. Kate is an associate professor of art history at Santa Clara University and president of the Native American Art Studies Association. Thank you, Kathleen. I will say what everyone else who gets anywhere close to this podium is going to say. It is such an honor to be here and um, be able to talk about Kay's work, and especially with her here. So thank you, Kay, for your generosity over the years with all the scholars and curators. In 1970, when Kay Walkingstick stood in front of her easel to paint this self-portrait, she was 35 years old an accomplished painter whose work was being shown in galleries in New York and garnering positive reviews in the press. The professional artist's self-confidence and seriousness of purpose are on full display here. Walking Stick shows herself as a maker of images, clad in her ubiquitous painter's apron, posed in front of one of her own paintings. Throughout the 1960s, Walking Stick had devoted herself to her marriage and to raising her two children, Erica and David, but she had never failed to find time to paint, in attics and spare bedrooms and rented studios. Now, with the children entering adolescence, she moved more fully into her career as an artist and educator. In 1973, with the financial assistance of a Danforth Foundation Fellowship for Women, Walking Stick enrolled in the MFA program at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. She was 38 years old. My presentation today concentrates on this period in Walking Stick's career, from just prior to her entrance into graduate school to her turn towards the diptych format that became such an important part of her work in the early 1980s. This is an immensely rich period in the development of Walking Stick's art, one in which she used her work to explore various aspects of her own identity as an artist, as a woman, as a wife, daughter, and mother, as a sexual being, and as a native person. It is also a time in which Walking Stick was deeply engaged with the formal and intellectual developments of modernist painting, conducting sustained investigations into the physical properties of pigment and canvas, the depiction of figures in space, and the tensions between representational and abstract imagery. By the end of the 1970s, Walking Stick had succeeded in imbuing minimalist forms with serious emotional content. She had dispensed with the figure and developed in its stead an artistic vocabulary of abstract archetypal imagery that has carried throughout her long career. In tracing Walking Stick's movement into modernist forms, there is perhaps no better place to begin than with her self-portrait. While the artist's depiction of herself conveys aspects of her psychology as well as her sense of identity, her treatment of the painting within the painting functions as a near primer of her formal concerns in the medium. In contrast to the figure of the artist, who is drawn in some detail, the reclining nude in the background is a mere silhouette of a body, of equal mass or substance to the space that surrounds it. Looking back on these works 40 years later, Walking Stick explains, I liked the idea of using figures in the painting, but it was the depiction of space and shape that interested me. I wanted to make a contemporary statement about figures in space, end quote. 
In Walking Stick's view, contemporary space was compressed, flattened in a way that made only the slimmest use of linear perspective and spatial devices such as shading and modeling. The reclining nudes in Self-Portrait and April Contemplating May are reduced to silhouettes, not to diminish their bodies, but to emphasize the flatness of the space they inhabit, and thus to underscore their modernity. This compression of the picture plane is the hallmark of Walking Stick's representational style in the very early 70s. Me and My Neon Box, Fantasy for a January Day, and Feet series arrangement are all feature silhouettes of figures or parts of figures rendered in an array of candy colors against backgrounds that offer only the barest hint of spatial context. Me and My Neon Box exhibits a few illusionist devices, such as overlapping of the figures and angling of the line defining the top of the box to orient it in space. However, the size of the figures does not seem to diminish into space. The feet of the uppermost figure push into the foreground. Moreover, Walking Stick has manipulated the color fields to deny recession. The negative spaces formed between the figures become abstracted forms in their own right, confusing the relationship between figure and ground. In sum, the space of Walking Stick's paintings of 1971 to 1973 is cubist space, reminiscent of Picasso's Le Mademoiselle d'Avignon, in which spatial planes and bodies are so fractured and intertwined as to become nearly indistinguishable from one another. Walking Stick acknowledges the direct influence of Cubism on her work of this period. Quote, I was educated in Bauhaus and Cubism. I certainly love Cubism. I think that was the most influential thing in the 20th century. It affected everybody, all of us, in greater or lesser degrees. End quote. While the Cubists employed a multitude of short, straight lines to fracture and flatten perspective, Walking Stick's use of color creates a similar effect. As for the treatment of the figures, they are still embodied in a sense. Picasso's women are symbolically reclaimed by walking stick. Me and my neon box is in fact a composite self-portrait. Each of the forms is based on the artist's own body. That the bodies in question are sensual bodies is underscored by the single anatomical detail that is rendered here, the shading of the genitalia. As walking stick puts it, there's a joyousness in their nakedness. They're enjoying their bodies, end quote. Given the exuberant sensuality and sexuality of these figures, I tell you with some regret that these are among the last fleshed bodies to appear in Walking Stick's paintings for nearly 30 years. We needn't view this as a rejection of the body, however. Indeed, I would argue that the sensuality of the subject matter is transferred quite effectively into that of the material itself. Rather, at this moment in Walking Stick's career, the waning of the figure is a consequence of the work turning towards ever more minimalist forms. Once again, change is heralded in a picture within a picture. I'm speaking of the blue field in April contemplating May that reads as a window, but is actually a painting, pieces of sky, a nine second comp section composition that Walking Stick completed while at McDowell Colony in New Hampshire in 1970. Responding in part to an environmental crisis, the construction of an enormous power station on the East River in Queens, Walking Stick produced a series of sky paintings include pieces of sky, who Stole My Sky, and Big Alice is Not Earth Mother. In the series, Walking Stick depicted both the worst case scenario for pollution, the sky with a void as its center, Who Stole My Sky, and also the most hopeful vision, the clear, fresh air of pieces of sky. As formal investigations, the paintings were indebted to some extent to the surrealist painter René Magritte, but also to Bauhaus alumnus Joseph Albers and pop artist Jasper Johns. Even before Walking Stick enrolled at Pratt in 1973, she had been making regular trips from her home in New Jersey to New York City art studios, museums, and galleries. She drew inspiration from everywhere, Albers and Johns, color field painters like Ad Reinhardt and Mark Rothko, minimalists such as Bryce Martin. At Pratt, Walking Stick was exposed to a range of new work through the school's visiting artist series, and she recalls being particularly inspired by Helen Frankenthaler, who was pioneering techniques of staining canvases, and Sam Gilliam, an African-American painter best known for removing his canvases from the support and letting them hang loose like draped fabric. Intrigued by the shapes that Gilliam's draped canvases make, Walking Stick undertook a series of studies of an artist's apron the same apron she wore in Self-Portrait of 1970. In each of these paintings, including a sensual succession, the apron is shown hanging from a nail with the apron strings pinned to the apexes of a triangle drawn on the studio wall. 
These aprons approach the level of trompe l'oeil imagery with the details of material seams, paint smears, finger marks, folds, and gatherings of fabric all faithfully rendered. The forms also tend towards abstraction, flattening against the wall as they begin to conform to the grid mapped on the color field behind them. According to Walking Stick, the simple iconic shapes of the aprons opened her eyes to other similar forms. Teepee form of 1974 represents a synthesis of this swirl of visual, emotional, and intellectual stimuli that Walking Stick encountered in graduate school. On the one hand, the teepee references Walking Stick's native identity and her relationship with her father, as it does in the contemporaneous work, Messages to Papa. On the other hand, the teepee is a nearly perfect manifestation of the paradox of the canvas as both a two-dimensional and potentially three-dimensional form. In Walking Stick's painted version, the material is depicted as if suspended and draped rather delicately over a network of cords that stretch from the studio ceiling to the floor. The shapes that result from this supposed arrangement of fabric and cord do not quite conform to three dimensions, however. They refuse to behave rationally. Where the top edge of the fabric remains taut, its lower edges bow dramatically. Where guide wires run in strong diagonals, the fabric seldom follows suit. The form becomes increasingly abstracted, calling into question the exact orientation of the object in space. In nearly every retrospect, TP form pushes beyond the literalism of the apron series towards a deeper engagement with modernist painting. Formally, the work is reminiscent of Mark Rothko's abstractions, such as Earth and Green. Sorry, I'm off here. Though not as large as Rothko's canvas, at six by five feet, teepee form is significantly larger than Walking Stick's earlier works, and this change in scale enhances the visual affinity between the two works. As in Earth and Green, the shapes in teepee form are basically two large blocks of color that either float, in Rothko's case, or seem to be suspended, in Walking Stick's, in front of a third color field. In both paintings, the color fields bleed into one another, an effect that Rothko achieved through applying oil paint with sponges to saturate the canvas with pigment. Walking Stick's method, which was likely inspired by Frankenthaler's and Gilliam's, was to prime her canvas by pouring ink down it, then painting over the stained material with acrylic. The result is a work that pushes prevailing modernist notions about painting to their ontological limits. The object that is pictured in teepee form, a length of canvas stained with ink and painted with acrylic, is of the same substance and nature of painting itself. In the works that followed teepee form, Walking Stick pursued her investigation of the figure ground relationship, edging ever closer to pure abstraction. She also paid increasing attention to her material. Inspired in part by her affection for the rich and caustic surfaces of Bryce Martin and Jasper Johns, in 1975, Walking Stick sought out a process that would allow her to mix wax into acrylic rather than oil paint. She located a product designed for use on batik fabrics and adapted it for her purposes. With the addition of wax, her paint became thicker, more viscous and substantial, and ultimately more sensual. It made this lovely surface, Walking Stick recalls, I had always loved paint. It was this physical joyous thing, but now I just fell in love with that surface." End quote. Though she would come to use her hands to apply paint and wax in increasingly thick, deeply textured layers in subsequent paintings, the material of, for John Ridge was applied with a palette knife to create a relatively thin, smooth, and lustrous surface. In this case, the quiet of the surface and the dense of the black pigment combined to convey an air of solemnity appropriate to the painting's subject matter. The work is an elegy for the prominent Cherokee statesman who was assassinated in 1839. Formally, the revelation of For John Ridge is the isolation and development of the arc, the shape that was created in the apron series as the negative space between the top edge of the draped fabric and the bottom edge of the inscribed triangle. Once singled out, the arc became the critical recurring element of Walking Stick's now entirely abstract compositions. For the artist, the arc was a negative shape like the space between bodies and forms, as well as the trace of a positive gesture, the movement of her hand or arm across the surface of a canvas. By the time she embarked on the Chief Joseph series in late 1974, Walking Stick had codified this gesture into a purely geometric form, but it was never fully divorced from its origin in the body. Because the Chief Joseph series will be discussed at length by Dr. Miller and others at this symposium, I will limit my remarks here to a few salient points. 
The series, which Walking Stick commenced in graduate school but did not finish for three years, is comprised of 36 separate ink-stained canvases, each depicting four basic elements in acrylic and wax, two small convex forms and two larger ones, arranged vertically inside a rectangular field. The series strives to convey profound and tragic subject matter, the forced exodus of the Nez Perce Chief Joseph and his people, though de through devoutly minimalist, even formulaic imagery. For Walking Stick, these were not irreconcilable differences. She explains, my goal when I made the Chief Joseph pieces was to make not only these abstractions, these ideas about an idea, but also to have energy and emotion, which in general the minimalists had tried to avoid. They didn't want not only meaning, but emotion, and they certainly didn't want narrative." End quote. Seen in this light, aspects of the series can be understood to support a narrative intent. The rhythm and repetition of the multiple canvases evoke the long journey of Chief Joseph and his followers across 1,100 miles of Oregon, Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana territories. At the level of the individual panels, this sense of movement is absence. In its place, there is a static form that the artist hoped would convey an ultimate sense of peace, of rest. She notes, it was all about expressing emotion through these very simple means. I really wanted to be as simple as possible, very, very reduced. I wanted to take it all as far as I could and still have a painting that said something. In her ongoing effort to reduce her forms, to distill them into archetypal images that test the boundary between object and idea, Walking Stick turned in 1977 to a series of studies on paper. To create these black-on-black -black drawings, the artist applied charcoal by hand, utilizing a great deal of pigment and force to produce a dense, dark color field. Once she had achieved a velvety, smooth, uniform surface, Walking Stick used a stylus to scratch away at the pigment, creating lighter-hued versions of the convex forms found in the Chief Joseph paintings. In later iterations of the series, a subsurface layer of color was applied, and the resulting forms appear as red or green shapes floating on a black field. In every case, Walking Stick used a grid to organize her forms, tracing the lines on the paper before applying pigment. The matrix was crucial to the composition of these sketches, and Walking Stick had used it before to varying degrees. Pieces of Sky, for example, which dates back to 1971, was arranged in a grid pattern. Nascent grids also appear in the guise of lines drawn on the studio wall in the Aprons series and teepee form. In the Chief Joseph series, a proto-grid is formed by the often overlooked elements of the composition, namely the set of lines that connect the convex forms to one another and to the rectangular frame. Acknowledging the efficacy of such lines to order a composition and promote stasis, Walking Stick remarks, quote, I needed those lines to ground the forms. Of all the functions that a grid performs, Walking Stick is perhaps most interested in its ability to flatten space. In a seminal article, Grids of 1979, Rosalind Krauss declared that the grid was the means of crowding out the dimensions of the real and replacing them with the lateral spread of a single surface. What this meant for minimalist painters such as Frank Stella and Ang Angus Martin was that elements of form were to be spread evenly across an entire composition. For walking stick, the grid was less literally inscribed, but it was essential to her compositions. I want the grid to be sensed, she said, if you're aware, if you really look at the drawings. This length is a quarter of that whole. This length is a half of the next unit. It's geometry, a portion of a circle on a field, a line that relates to the length of the arm. It's a serious kind of geometry, end quote. Through the use of the grid, walking stick established, or perhaps discovered, a potent means of conveying the sense of stillness and peace that she had been seeking. By 1981, the smooth, serene surfaces of the black-on-black -black drawings, and even of the encaustic paintings, such as for John Ridge, had been replaced by agitated, excised, heavily impostoed canvases with titles like Genesis, Violent Garden. Even as the subject matter and surface treatment of the work shifted radically, however, elements of the earlier compositions remained constant, including the vocabulary of arcs and lines. The grid and the square format, which Walking Stick embraced for their modernist sensibilities and negation of three-dimensional space, became even more important as the surface of the paintings became thicker and more layered and more literally three-dimensional. Genesis Violent Garden, for example, is built up of dozens of layers of acrylic and wax with modeling paste and ground seashells thrown into the mix. 
The assertive materiality and accumulated thickness of the new paintings underscored their status as objects, a quality that was important to the artist and to critics. Writing for Art News in 1981, Deborah Phillips remarked that Walking Stick's new approach to the canvas lent an immediacy and directness to the work. Frederick Castle of Art in America agreed, noting that the paintings look somewhat like paintings, which they are, but also like large, heavy square objects affixed to a wall, end quote. As rigorously physical as they were, the new works were also increasingly psychologically expressive. They were, in fact, increasingly gestural in the sense that the artist Marx recorded her bodily actions as well as her thoughts and emotions. Walking Stick recalls, I had been scratching surfaces for years to activate them. It gives it a lot of life to manipulate the surface physically, although the action also conveys a certain anger. In the case of Genesis' Violent Garden and Satyr's Garden, the emotion was not anger per se, but acknowledgement of the violence and veiled threats that permeate our myths and archetypes. The gardens are dark, Walking Stick says. They're imagined gardens. They're night gardens. Imaginary or not, it's important to recognize that the gardens are in effect landscapes. They are interiors inspired by the darkened environment of Walking Stick's attic studio, brought into physical being through the manipulation of pigment and material surfaces. It's impossible to know whether Walking Stick's naming of the works was a subliminal recognition of her growing interest in landscape, or whether these titles call out the latent tendencies of the multi-layered canvases to evoke the strata of a geophysical earth. Either way, the transition in Walking Stick's imagery from resolutely geometric forms to the abstract landscapes that would occupy her for the next three decades had begun. In 1983, Walking Stick received support from the Edward Albee Foundation to spend a month as an artist in residence in Montauk, Long Island. It would prove a transformational experience. Almost immediately, paintings such as Montauk 1 and 2 reflected the change from working indoors in the city to working outdoors where she could see the sea. Walking Stick continued to build monumental canvases. These are nearly five feet square, layering them by hand with paint and wax and pebbles taken directly from the beach. As she scratched through softly glowing tones of dusky pink and amber into pale green layers below, she was aware that the wavy vertical lines she was creating were suggestive of trees or dune grasses scattered throughout the composition. Enticingly, in both paintings, Walking Stick also inscribed a short, thick, straight horizontal line segment in the middle of the canvas. Though the length and placement of each segment is determined by a mathematical ratio, it's tempting to interpret them as fragmented horizon lines. Walking Stick allows that the paintings had, quote, a little bit more to do with the landscape and Montauk than with the, just the inside of my head, end quote. I will conclude today with this final iteration of the Montauk series, the panel that appears here on the right, paired with an acrylic on paper in the formation of Walking Stick's first diptych composition. The painting was recreated in response to an invitation that Walking Stick received to contribute a work to an exhibition entitled Homage to the American Elm in Cooperstown in 1985. Initially, Walking Stick intended to submit only the work on the left, an impressionistic memory of an elm, its branches spread in a fan shape across the paper. The elm was the most representational painting Walking Stick had produced in nearly a decade. Rather than let it stand as such, the artist searched her studio for a way to ground this work in abstraction. She decided to pair the panel with one inspired by the Montauk paintings, which had also contained tree forms. This version on the right side of the diptych reproduces the wavy vertical lines of those earlier forms, but the color palette has shifted dramatically to a milky white that is symbolic of death. It is the color of a tree blighted by Dutch elm disease. Walking Stick averts that the symbolism of the short horizontal line is altered here too uh, to suggest annihilation. Thus, while the left panel of Death of the Elm conveys meaning through sensual and expressive, albeit representational form, the right speaks through the profound and eternal language of abstraction. Over the span of a decade, from the early 1970s to the early 80s, Kay Walking Stick's paintings progressed from hard-edged federal work through the most devoutly minimalist forms to find resolution finally in her signature diptychs. In the course of this journey, two constants were revealed, an artist's fierce dedication to challenging herself and her unfailing passion for the, quote, this wonderful stuff we call paint. Thank you. Thank you.